Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, January 16th, and this is the weekly market update. Okay, this week's reality check. Uh, borrowed this first bullet point from an article that I read on the internet, pretty good. Goes over what uh, some of the issues will be facing going forward, regardless of who would have got elected president. But uh, basically, the gist of the article was Biden's banana republic. You know, it talks about, uh, in the beginning of the article, what's a banana republic? You know, we joke around about it. We make fun of these other countries that are in dire straits financially and have unstable political situations. But that's kind of like what we're in right now. And so in political science, the term banana republic describes a politically unstable country with an economy dependent upon the exportation of a limited resource product, such as bananas or minerals. And the author of the article suggests that our main export is paper U.S. dollars. I don't know if that was tongue in cheek or not, but you get the point. Go on uh, on the definition of a banana republic. Typically, a banana republic has a society of extremely stratified social classes. Well, I would suggest that that's probably what we're seeing here in the United States. Usually a large impoverished, impoverished working class and the ruling class plutocracy composed of the business, political, and military elites of that society. That's exactly what we have. You know, if you recall, I don't really care about your political persuasion, but you really can't deny that we have severe income inequality. We have a stratification and a bifurcation of society of the average person and then the elites of society, the nomenclatura, the, uh, you know, leaders that are ensconced in their ivory towers that are our betters. The, I call them uh, derisively the masters of the universe, so, so-called. And then the rest of us schlubs. And that's really how it is. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. You know, I would suggest to anyone that actually thinks that a 78-year-old man that's been in politics for 40 years is going to be an agent of change. I know there's a lot of people that don't, that hate the orange man. That's fine. Uh, he's not my favorite guy on earth also, but uh, Joe Biden isn't the change you've been waiting for. It's just going to be meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And so where are we going with this? Debt, okay, the state of our economy, COVID. Let me talk about a couple of scenarios from the article and then what I've also been thinking about myself. Let me share a few thoughts. The, basically, since the Reagan administration, the, the U.S. debt has basically averaged a doubling every eight years. And with the exception of Trump and Bush one, all the other presidents since that time have had two terms. So basically what we're saying is we've doubled the debt every eight years. So Trump became president in January 2017. He inherited a debt of 20 trillion, of which Bush, uh, Obama had inherited around a $10 trillion budget and debt, uh, debt and dub had doubled it to, to, to 220. So then right now it's about 27, 28 trillion. And so it's easy to forecast that eight years later, this debt would be $40 trillion. The $28 trillion forecast for January 2021 is just the mathematical in-between. Biden really only has one option right now, print and spend. This is what he said. If we don't act now, things are going to get much worse and harder to get out of the hole later. We're in a situation now where the US economy is basically being elevated with the helium of deficit financing and handouts and, and monetary creation by the Federal Reserve. Now people are gonna go right to me, we don't, yes, this is going to eventually be inflationary. It's already happening if you're not paying attention. We are in the beginnings of an inflationary uh, cycle, reflation. Some people are saying it's a, just an inflationary imp, um, impulse and it will fade. That's exactly right. They're going to have to have higher and higher levels of creation of, of money and debt. 
If they don't, this whole thing implodes into a deflationary depression. And that's not going to be allowed to happen. So they only have one thing that they can do. So it didn't really matter if it was Bush, or if it was Trump or Biden. MMT has arrived. The end game is approaching for all of the largesse that has been allowed to occur over the last 40 or 50 years. And we're coming to the end of, you know, or the 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 beginning of the end of the American empire. Now, I'm throwing a lot of words at you, a lot of thoughts. Think about it. If you go back to even before COVID started, I take you back to the winter of 2018 when we entered 2019. It was on this video channel. It was in my blog. It was in my newsletter. Oil prices at that time, everything was coming back, okay, pretty good. We were starting to see, you know, uh, the economy was going pretty good. I mean, for a 22 or $23 trillion economy, it was, we had record low unemployment, but we had a lot of instability. You know, oil prices were pushing $60 a barrel and inflationary uh, price increases were starting to happen in the economy. If you remember, the Federal Reserve had started to raise short-term interest rates. They had started to pull back a little bit on what they had been doing. And if you remember, we had that big hiccup in the markets. We had that repo market issue. Uh, we also had the um, stock market drop tremendously. And then the Fed had to immediately reverse course. I don't know if you recall that, but I do. And that was, you know, trying to take rates up from like one and a half percent to two and a half percent. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is this economy cannot handle normalization of rates. It cannot handle uh, stopping QE. It cannot handle uh, the government not in being involved and spending money. So when I say they only have one option, that's it. So what, what are they talking about doing? I mean, um, they're talking about, we've already approved uh, since the fiscal year started 21, which is in October of 20, you already had the nearly $1 trillion, that was your $600 checks, that got approved. Now Biden came out last week and he's talking about, um, let me see, I had a, okay, here it is. There's the Biden plan. Uh, Biden plan is 1.9 trillion. Uh, this is following you know, the Stephanie Kelton uh, methodology uh, that deficits don't matter. So current def deficit run rate is 2.4 trillion. Add 0.9 passed in last December add 1.9 this plan, add 3 trillion for part two, that implies a deficit this year of 8.2 trillion versus the 3.1 trillion uh, deficit last year, budget deficit. This is in the context of a 22 or $23 trillion economy. So what does Stephanie Kelton say about it? Well, she said back in November that she had been on a panel uh, with Gary Cohen, and she was asked how much money Congress should authorize. Conservatively, I suggested two trillion in immediate relief and three trillion in recovery. That's just about what the incoming president is recommending. Took less than a minute for Gary to say deficits aren't a concern, and he could live with Kelton's numbers. So it's an MMT world, folks. I thought we we had talked about this happening at some point. And I think that the COVID situation just accelerated this. That's all it did. Um, I was thinking these things were going to play out over, you know, three to five years. And it's basically accelerated uh, with the uh, change in administration. Now, another thing that I'm going to go ahead and go on the record as a forecast, you know, I never really bit big on the whole, all the COVID numbers. I think the thing got away from, we talked about this in the pre previous video, I think Louis Gov at uh, Gov Cal Capital was quite prescient and correct when he said that most of the initial reaction, although may have been, you know, uh, because we didn't have a lot of information, the politicians weren't really going to pull back and declare that their decisions were wrong. It's a CYA political setup. Nobody wants to get called out on Twitter. So, you know, we just had a, had a, had a, study come out from Stanford University this, this week uh, by not quite crackpots, people like John Anides, like I've talked about before, other people there uh, that uh, I'll put a link to it. And they basically say the lockdowns and masks don't work. 
It doesn't work. The only thing that works is, you know, vaccines. So we've basically destroyed our economy based on politicians needing to do something, covering their backside so they don't get, you know, chastised uh, at, at the Twitter by the Twitter mob and end up, you know, it's always better to do more and say that, you know, you were looking out for everybody's welfare than to get caught with your pants down. That's basically happened to Trump. And so here's where we're at. We've destroyed the economy. We've destroyed people's lives. And now the solution is, is to do what they've always wanted to do anyways, which is just create money out of thin air and spend it. And so, so when somebody tells me that you're not going to have price rises, well, that's right, because the, the previous instances of QE and money creation didn't make it into the real economy, didn't make it into the hands of people that spend it. It made it into financial assets. That's why you didn't have price increases. That's why you didn't have price in inflation in goods and services, which I maintain isn't actually correct, but that's a whole other argument. I brought that up last week. Now you're going to have direct payments to people. Okay, you're going to have grants given to mismanaged democratic states and cities. What do you think they're going to do? Just put the money in a piggy bank? They're going to dole it out. They're going to spend it. It's not going to get spent efficiently. If you remember back in during the Obama administration or at the end of the Bush administration, uh, at the climax of the financial crisis, that was when the Obama had got elected. And there was all kinds of spending that happened. I think at that time, they were arguing about a $900 billion spending program. And that was a big deal, if you recall. And everybody was arguing about that. And it all got wasted, most of it. It was just, you know, it got doled out to the, and this is, you know, political patronage to the constituencies of the DNC. And the same thing happens when the Republicans are in charge. I, I, I'm an equal opportunity disliker of political parties and politicians. And so now we're going to go for it big now, and we're really going to have this experiment because um, circumstances call for it. Again, what's going to happen now? This is this isn't these numbers are not going to happen exactly. Why? Because a lot of people, you know, panic. Nothing is exactly the way it seems. Okay, yes, it's fifty-fifty in the Senate. The House of Representatives is. In Democratic hands, you have a Democratic president. The problem is, with unless they get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, you need sixty votes for a lot of these things, and they won't be able to get they won't be able to get sixty votes for all of these things. You've got people like Joe Manchin in West Virginia, who is a Democrat that's in, uh, a Democratic senator that's in a state that over that voted for Trump by forty points. So if you watch what he does, he's a lot of times let off the hook by Schumer because he's a Democrat that's basically in a red state. So you're, you've got a few people in this type of situation. How, they're going to have to peel back some of these numbers, but McConnell wants to spend money to all politicians. It's just going to be the degree. Is it going to be $8 trillion? I don't know. If it's $6 tri they don't have the money. We're already you know, at 130% of GDP on our debt. What kind of countries are in that situation? Well, Italy, Greece, Lebanon. These are not you know, good, good countries that are fiscally responsible where that's stable. The governments are not stable. The economy's not stable. Excellent interview this week on Macro Voices, link in the show notes with Luke Groman talking about this, talking about uh, what's going to happen with the U.S. dollar over time, and that his end game for the dollar is coming now. I thought it was an excellent, you know, is it confirmation bias in my mind? For me, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how this is, how they're going to, what happens if you do stick $8 trillion in one year in a $23 trillion economy? Uh, it certainly doesn't make prices go down. And I want to take you back in time. This is, uh, you know, I did a lot of screenshots this week. Maybe I was a little bit lazy on my, on my research. A lot of Twitter feeds had some really just good snapshots. Here is a, from November 29th, 2017, former Fed Chairman Janet Yellen, and now your future Treasury Secretary. She said that, you know, when the Orange Man administration was in power, that a $20 trillion national death, quote, should keep people awake at night, unquote. 
Well, by the time that this regime is out of power, if it gets eight years or four years, even we're going to be on our way, we're going to be past 30 on our way to $40 trillion in debt. Should that, if, if you're, if you should be waking up in cold sweats and having a nightmare at that point, but she's one of the, if you listen to what she's been saying, since she's been nominated for treasury, she's in, she's fully on board with this. You see, it's all about having power, having your hands on the wheel. That's how you can grift the most money. That's how you can take care. You can get power and money by just saying, but the internet never forgets and neither should you. But I guarantee you there's partisans out there and say, well, you don't understand. They'll spin it in their head. These people are not on your side. These people are not going to do these things to help you. These people have, don't have your best interests at heart. The point that I'm trying to make by bringing all this to your attention is it is time to take precautions. It is time to get ready for what's getting ready to happen. And it's already been happening and is happening. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not, you know, telling you that the world's going to come to an end, but this is going to get ugly. They don't have any other choice. They've told you what they're going to do. I've been saying this for months. It's becoming more and more clear. They have no choice at this point. They're boxed into a corner. At some point, we were going to get to the end game. You know, I reminded of what Felix Zuloff said, uh, famous former former Barron's Roundtable member, Swiss banker, finance uh manager of money in Switzerland uh, did the interview with Grant Williams on the end game with Grant Williams and Bill Fleckenstein. He said that he didn't see any reason why the Fed's balance sheet by the end of this decade won't be 40 or $50 trillion. I mean, can you imagine that? Do you see gold going down in that environment? Where's Bitcoin priced if the Fed's balance sheet is $50 trillion? Where's, what's the level of the U.S. dollar? I mean, these are things that should be gamed out in your mind. It certainly won't be a, uh, an environment you'll want to be, you know, living in. There'll be a lot of political inst instability and economic instability, I can assure you. And what can they do at this point? Is there going to be, you know, people say, you, we, I always say, you got to take the other side. What's the hole in their thesis, John? What's the blue plan? What's the enemy? What could they do to screw the plan up, to screw this up? Well, is there going to be a Fred? Uh, uh, is there going to be a Paul Volcker that's going to come along and raise rates, to, and normalize rates, and we're going to have this huge recession and slash depression? You know, as Luke Groman talks about in that interview, the when when Paul Volcker came in and crushed inflation in the late seventies, the debt to GDP of the U.S. was thirty percent. It's over a hundred percent now. There's not room to do any of these things. It's print or die. I mean, I hate to be a Peter, like talk like Peter Schiff or one of these guys, but that's kind of where we're at now. If they don't keep injecting money, if they don't keep, they got a lot of plates in the air, one misstep and everything comes down. And, you know, as long as you can keep people's bellies somewhat full and keep them somewhat pacified, you can keep some control. But if you have a deflationary depression, uh, and people literally go hungry and you have 30% unemployment and you have, you know, people get wiped out in pensions and 401ks and all these things immediately, the stock market going down 90%, like it happens in a lot of these other countries that go through these situations, there will be, you think that that little uh, fraternity prank that happened at the Capitol last week was, a, was, was a big deal. You, they would, you, you should look at the pictures of what Benito Mussolini looked like when they got done with him, because that's what would happen in a deflationary depression in this U S. So do I think they'll ultimately be successful? No, but they got to keep the game going and hope that something comes out of somewhere. They used to have, uh, I read an article or a book. I can't remember what it was. And they used to have these plays in medieval times and the protagonist in the play would get themselves into some situation that just was impossible to get out of. And it, it, I can't remember the, I'm going to screw the pronunciation up, but at the end, the plot was uh, the, the crescendo, the, the climax of the show. It was called Deuce Vault. I mean, literally God would come in and save the day. Well, that's not going to happen. 
That's a play. That's make believe. We've created this mess. We've got a big problem. It's not going away. Prepare yourself. Get ready. Profit. Take care of your family. Please don't put a, a board on a stick and go to these things in March. Don't get involved in that stuff. You're not going to, you're not going to have any, you're going to end up like that poor Air Force woman. That's not the way to do this. The world is your oyster. Expand your horizons. History is being made. Read Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. You're living history right now. You're one person in 330 million. You're not going to stand at the beach like King Canute and tell the tide not to come in. So, you know, I look around and I see copper at $3.60 a pound, a seven or eight year high. I see nickel at, you know, recent hot yearly highs. I see oil in a definite uptrend. I see commodity stocks breaking higher across the board. Here's a tweet. Corn prices up 67% since July. Soybean prices up 74% since July. Live cattle up 50% since July. Sugar up 75% since June. Bitcoin recently above 40,000. I can go on and on and on. I could bring the charts up. Go on stock charts. It's free uh, to look at the charts. Plug in the charts for all this stuff. You can see everything's going up at a 45 degree angle. You're in the middle of a reflation. You're in the middle of a crack of Mises crack up boom. That's what's happening. You're at the beginning stages. Our old friend uh, Fergus Cullen had a good tweet this week. Um, wanted to talk more about this because it's happening. Shale is in for a world of hurt, he says. Why? Several reasons that we've talked about before, but it's worth repeating. High grading in all three major shale bases, tier one locations, that's the easy pickings, went from representing 50% of all drilling in 2014 to nearly 80% today. Well, that's what happens all the time, right? Even in mining. And prices go down to keep the game going, to keep the cash flow, you, you grab the low-hanging fruit. The other thing we've talked about before, and he mentions here, the wall of debt, like close to $400 billion in debt is coming due over the next four years. There's not going to be an appetite by people in Wall Street or other investors to put money into junk bonds, even though people are yield starved. They've been burnt. Now, if oil goes to $100 a barrel, which I expect it will over the next couple of years or higher, yeah, drilling is going to return and then people, the money will come back. But it's, I don't think you're going to see the level of investment needed to bring the shale production back sufficiently to overtake the declines that are now in place. Another Macro Voices interview that you should listen to from the week before, this one was with Art Berman. He goes, oh, they go, him and Eric Townsend talk about this for an hour of what's going to happen or what is currently happening, happening in the shale oil space and why U.S. production is going to plunge. What else have we got? This is the big one that no one's talking about. Bullet point number three, ESG is going to cut off the easy money. Forget about getting loans. People are divesting themselves of oil investments because it is the politically correct thing to do. Banks, major banks are calling in loans and saying they're not going to make any more additional loans. So where is the money going to come from? You're, you're strangling, you're going to strangle the ability of the industry to rapidly increase. Now, when the price inevitably goes up, which it will, cash flows will allow them to, to grow their production, but not probably quickly, which will mean a higher oil price that wouldn't have normally been there and a longer bull market. That's what I think is going to happen. And I think this is one of the most misunderstood things that's happening, not only in oil, but in all of mining. I, I really, the, the cognitive dissonance in the ability of these people that are so-called environmentalists to hold two opposing thoughts in their head at the same time and not go insane is amazing to me. You're all about, you're all about shutting all this down where are they going to do the mining for the met coal i mean i love having these conversations with these people and explaining the oxygen blast furnace methodology for making steel 
that it requires coal to make the steel that they need for these app these uh, rebuildables. That's the, what I'm now calling renewables. Um, another guy coined that. I forget the guy, another author, but that's what they are. They're, re, they're rebuildables. You constantly, you know, the wind and the sun never go away. Those are renewable, but the machines you need to capture that energy are not renewable. You have to continuously build them. They wear out and they have to be replaced. So you are constantly having to do that. I've talked about how in wind, we're going through now, not even in some cases to the full life cycle of the original investment in the wind industry, for example, doing what's calling that a repower. You are basically putting, taking down the blades and the nacelle, the generator portion of the wind turbine and replacing it with a larger one. And you're not even through the first life cycle of the original equipment. And, you know, you get to enjoy all the tax advantages that go along with that in due course. But that stuff doesn't just, you know, magically appear. So where are you going to get the mining? Where are you going to get the, the raw materials? That's what I'm trying to tell folks. We're going to have this bull market in this stuff because the demand is going to be there for these things. There hasn't been necessary investment and it's going to be artificially held back by the same people that are clamoring for it. It's going to result in higher prices and a longer, um, longer running of the bull market. And then finally, burnt investors, once bitten, twice shy. And we're seeing it, right? I've, you know, uh, let's talk about Antero Resources real quick. I mean, that's something we've talked about publicly. It wasn't my idea. Other smart people gave it to me. The thing broke out again. Why? People are going, well, I had somebody DM me. Why is it going up? Natural gas prices really haven't broke out. Well, they're not just about natural gas prices. Look at the natural gas liquids, propane, ethane prices, and all these things, especially in the area in the mid-continent where they operate. I mean, you really have to know what's going on with these things. It's not you know, like a, a horse track tout sheet. You should really like understand why these things are going up. Delve into the business. Like I said, create a great Twitter, uh, curate a great Twitter, uh, follow a bunch of people that are smart. You'll learn a lot. That's what I do. People ask me how, how I get all these ideas. Most of them aren't my ideas. They're people that I know and people that I interact with ideas. And I just look at them and say, yeah, that's a good idea. Validate it and then put my money down. Wanted to talk about shipping. Wanted to talk about tankers. If you are holding tankers stocks, get ready for a, lot, a couple few bad quarters. Tanker rates are not very high right now, but steel scrap prices are near all-time highs, okay? Or near recent term highs, I should say. So what does that mean? If you have a, remember we talked about older ships, 15 years, 20 year old tankers, uh, the lifespan of a tanker is about 15 to 20 years. Every so many years, you have to take it through a special survey. It gets more expensive to get the ship certified to carry crude oil. They're not just running around loose out there. They have to get these special surveys. They have to go into a dry dock. They have to be inspected. You know, they're less efficient ships. They have higher maintenance. So if you have low tanker rates, which we're going to have over the next couple quarters, but you have high steel rates, what are you going to see? increased scrapping. We've already seen three VLCCs, very large crude carriers, go to scrap in Bangladesh in the, just the first month of this year. And the expectation is that's going to accelerate. Now, that's one of the catalysts we have for this three to five year super cycle we're talking about in tankers, because no one's building any new tankers. And we've talked about why that is. And this is another catalyst. What we want to do is we want to track this and see if this, in fact, the scrapping picks up. So if people were on the fence as a ship operator saying, well, should I, should I hold this ship and hope for a recovery? Or should I just, you know, take the high uh, bid that I'm being uh, offered to scrap it and do it? I think that I'll, with these high prices being offered for, for scrap prices, for steel scrap, you could see a whole herd of tankers go to scrap. Something to keep in mind. Now, 
as I've said before, shipping is very diverse. There's like eight or nine different sectors in shipping. Just because oil tankers are down, containers, you know, those 40-foot containers they ship goods in, that's booming right now. LPG, liquefied petroleum gas tankers, are booming. So uh, I really think that, you know, if you're going to be involved in these things, you need to understand. So even though the price of or the, the day rates for tank for large crude carriers and Suez Max tankers is down quite a bit, the net asset value of those companies is really low. The scrapping is going to do two things. I think people are going to scrap a lot of older ships because they don't want to pay to, if they don't think that, you know, you might as well take the money, a burden hand, instead of just gambling that rates are going to come back with these older ships and you don't have to pay for another special survey, pay for the dry dock, just scrap the damn thing and move on. You're going to do it anyways in the next couple of years. You might as well hit the high bid. That lowers what? It lowers the uh, amount of ships that are available. Now, remember, one of our theses, our thesis in tankers is that the tanker fleet is shrinking and it's not being rebuilt. There's not orders being put in. And that's for several reasons. Uh, financing, the previous boom, uh, rates not being consistently high enough to to stimulate uh, people to build new ships, plus the IMO 2020 regulations that happened a couple of years ago, and now the impending 2030 regulations, which haven't been finalized and isn't going to allow for people to take the necessary risk to spend, you know, 50, 60 million dollars, 70 million dollars on a new ship and not know if, if the thing's going to be outdated by the time, you know, it gets built. The regulations may, it may not be compliant. So that's going to hold back. So you see these distortions that get caused by these regulatory bodies. And you really have to understand what's going on. You can't just say, well, John said buy tankers or Cuppy said tankers were good. And are you still holding them, John? The ones I have, yes, because they're selling at 50 cents on the dollar. And I think that we're going to get our cycle. Now, they're, I'm not a trader, though. Right? I'm not a trader. I've said that before. So I can sit for three to five years and wait. My portfolio was up quite a bit last year. It was actually being dragged down by the tankers I hold, but they'll get their day in the sun. Uh, but I'm not a trader. I can't, you know, I can't tell you the day it's going to turn around. But I wanted to point this out because this is the kind of news, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. This is the kind of thing we want to see on the bottom. Okay, so I went through this pretty quick. This was kind of a... A lot of tweets that I saw this week. This is kind of an indication of the kind of people that I follow on Twitter. You know, I've, I've told I've told you guys before that you really need to be on Twitter. Uh, I really don't care about all the political stuff. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get off Twitter. Uh, I don't use it. You know, I don't go on there. Yes, occasionally I will retweet or like something that's uh, sarcastic politically, but most of the things what I'm doing is just reading through my feed and seeing all the all the good information and links and stuff that I get that uh, like this, for example, that uh, I get and I just, you know, say, okay, well, that's another piece of the pie. I stick that in there. That's another piece of knowledge. And then it all starts coming together. And uh, to put together, you know, the ideas that I have. But I really do think guys to sum up, you know, We've had a big run. I want you to be cautious. I have a lot of new subscribers. A lot of people are coming on board. Why? Because they're seeing those charts on a lot of those commodity stocks, okay? They're seeing copper at 360. They're seeing the oil stocks double. I've got stocks in my portfolio that have more than doubled. You know, and people are that, you know, that shiny object, you know, that FOMO starts kicking in. Well, John's making money. Let me get on, get on board. Remember now, we, we're overbought. Nothing goes straight up in a straight line. You know, think I'm thinking on this thing three to five years out, what I think is going to happen. And there's going to be a lot of drawdowns. There's going to be a stair step, right? Things go up, they pull back, they consolidate, they move higher. It's the same thing. You, know, you don't see anybody talking about gold right now. You know, a lot of the gold stocks are looking tremendous right here, but nobody's even talking about them. They were taught, you couldn't, that's all anybody wanted to talk about back in August, July or August. Now, no one talks about it. That's what I'm looking at right now. 
So you've got to be thinking that way. Don't be like some walleye or a crappie chasing a lure, the shiny object. That's what everybody else does. Okay. When things get ahead, don't be anxious to buy. Uh, I don't want to call the person out. I have a new subscriber. They said, you know, I really want to, you know, make sure I'm making the right decisions. Slow down. You haven't missed anything. People, I've had several DMs, several requests for information and emails. Did I miss it? Did I miss it? Is it over? No, it's not over. It's going to go a lot higher. Look at what's happened in uranium. A lot of people are freaking out. Some people, I mean, I remember buying Paladin at four or five cents a share. I remember the first interview I did with Ferg, we were talking, I was buying shares of Paladin, you know, I think it's eight cents while we were on the, having the interview. Where's it at now? Is it over? No, it's not over. The uranium price hasn't even really moved yet. The prices have just moved in anticipation. We haven't seen anything yet. It's the same thing in the oil stocks. You've got oil stocks that at $60 a barrel, the companies are going to be cash flow machines. So if they're up 100%, they're off, up 100% off like, you know, generational lows. They're going a lot higher. But that doesn't mean you just rush headlong in and shoot your wad. So real quick, one of the things I do, this is what I do. I'm not telling you to do this. You really don't know the best entry price. And what happens a lot of times is people wait for, I'll wait for a pullback. And then it doesn't really pull back like they think. If you have a good idea, if you have done the research and you have conviction on an idea, then what I normally do is I know I'm going to put so much X amount of capital, say a hundred dollars for, this is just for discussion purposes into an idea. I'll immediately put the first tranche in $25, 25% of it in. Okay. And I'll say, okay, I'll see what happens. If the stock pulls, if the company pulls back, which is inevitably going to happen at some point, then I count my blessings and I may commit another tranche, another 25%. It may rally some more. You know, you don't want to shoot your wad all at once. But then again, you don't want to wait for that. I've had people tell me, well, I'm going to wait for these things to pull back 50%. But do you, you know, will it pull back that far? You know, when you're in a bull market, things pull back, but they don't, they're in, if you're in a bull market, you're in a bull market. You don't normally get 50% drawdowns in a bull market. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is you haven't missed it. And you need to scale in slowly. Be patient. You know, it's not the end of the world. They're not going to run out of oil stocks. Okay. The time to be buying them was six months ago or a year ago. And I told you to buy them. Nobody wanted them then. People were actually writing me emails. You remember you long time guys in the comments, I was all wet people laughing at me. I don't get those anymore. I get a lot of signups in the newsletter now. And it kind of concerns me because I don't want people coming over here like this is some greyhound tout, tout sheet. This is serious business. This is serious wealth consideration creation. And if you play it right, you can make a tremendous amount of money. If you want to FOMO this thing and think you're going to out trade, it's a recipe for disaster. As I mentioned before, let me tell this last story because this thing's going on. Let me re-emphasize this because it is so important. Peter Lynch, who ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund, I talked about this in a previous video, but it's worth talking about again. He was one of the most successful money managers of like the 80s and early 90s. I think, I don't know what his combined return was. It was tremendous. It was something like 20 something percent a year. I don't know the exact numbers. It was out of this world. And he, so much money rushed into that fund. And if you would have bought it and held it, you would have made a tremendous return. But do you know that Fidelity did a study? You can look this up on the internet. Look up uh, most investors in Magellan Fund lost money. There was a study done. Most of the people, even though the fund was one of the best performing funds over like a decade period, and Peter Lynch is a famous, well-known investor of all time, one up on Wall Street, all that. Most of the people that invested in the fund, retail investors, actually lost money. Why? Because they would read, they would go into Money Magazine and see that the Fidelity Magellan Fund uh, for like 1987 or 1988 was the best performing fund. They'd put their money into it. It would have a down year the next year, then they'd pull their money out. They would buy it. That's what most retail does. They do it consistently. That's the only thing they're consistent at. Buying at the top, selling at the bottom, chasing the shiny object. 
can't sit still, don't know what they're buying, don't know, didn't do the research, didn't build the conviction, don't write it down, don't understand. What kind of damn results do you think you're going to get? I'm telling you guys, please take your time, pull the reins back, purge the excitement and emotion out of your thinking. What am I doing here? Why do I think this is a good idea? How do I scale into this? And what am I trying to do? Write it down on a piece of paper and revisit it, please. All right, that's it for this week. Channel continues to grow. Things are going good. We had our best month for signups in the newsletter, Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, $150 a year. People ask me, what do you get? Well, you get a newsletter every month. I talk about the current picks. I show you where we're at. If there's any news on the stocks in there, I make you aware of it. If I think it's material, I give you my comments. Uh, if I find a good company that I think is being, you know, should be added, I add it. You get new picks, not every month, only when I think it's necessary. I put my money in these, these same picks. And then I have the back issues available for you. I've been uh, uploading them on my website. You get access to all that. Okay, that's what you get. If you sign up for the Patreon, if you want to support me on Patreon, and you do $5 support, which you can cancel the next month if you want, I will send you one pick. This is hard for people to understand. I will send you one of the current month's recent picks one time so you can get a sample of what kind of companies we're looking at and what kind of stocks you can we're dealing with. One time. It's not ongoing. I need to explain that again. So avail yourself of that. If you just enjoy these videos, a lot of people tell me I get a lot of, I'm getting a lot of good uh, feedback. People say they enjoy this. People say this is refreshing. It's honest. Hey, I'm just a guy. Somebody asked me the other day, what's my credentials? I'm just a guy. And I want to help people. This is a chance. We're going into very, very tumultuous waters. A lot of things are going to happen that are unexpected. A lot of things are going to happen that if you're not prepared for, uh, if at least you're not considering, uh, are going to shock people and are going to cause people to make, if you don't make the right decision, you're going to, it's going to cost you a lot. And I'm trying to uh, at least get people to learn from my previous experience of being through several other market cycles and not even knowing what the heck was going on. The benefit of 30, 40 years of reading, thinking, investing, and finally, hopefully somewhat figuring it out. So that's what, that's what I'm trying to do. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week.